Hello friends, I am Dr. Rajesh Chokhani, a general pediatrician from Bandra, Mumbai and today we will be talking about early diagnosis of bacterial infections, acute bacterial infections. So friends, whenever patients present to us with any symptoms, we try to analyze them and try to decide whether those symptoms are due to an infection and if it is an infection then whether it is bacterial or viral. We know that viral infections are usually associated with generalized symptoms and signs whereas bacterial infections are associated with localized symptoms and signs. If we were to analyze the fever in great detail, we can suspect bacterial infections early. So, just high fever is not necessarily a sign of a bacterial infection, but if the child is poorly responsive to antibiotics and the child is dull and inactive in not only at the peak of fever, but also in the interfebrile period, it tells us that the child is dull and inactive not just because of high fever but it is because of the toxemia of the underlying illness. So this points to a bacterial infection and would help us to start looking for localization early. For clinicians there are two kinds of bacterial infections those which localize early for example acute tonsillitis, acute bacillary dysentery, acute lymphadenitis where when we start looking for localization we will find the relevant findings like an inflamed red painful tonsil or a acute inflamed swelling in the neck or a blood and mucus in the stools etc. The second type of bacterial infections which clinicians see are called bacteremic bacterial infections where the first two three days there is a phase of bacteremia before the infection localizes to a particular organ. The clinician sees this phase as a rising trend of fever which is then followed by localization which is most commonly either to the respiratory tract or to the CNS in the form of meningitis. So by day three day four if we don't find these symptoms of localization we can even start suspecting typhoid early even before the abdominal signs have come up. Of course, we can confirm it later with a blood culture. Occasionally, a bacterial infection progresses so rapidly that the child deteriorates even before there are any localizing symptoms. Examples being meningococcal infections or a rapidly progressive staphylococcal infection. In such cases, we clinicians can suspect a bacterial infection early if there is a significant change in sensorium even before there are symptoms of localization. Even serious infections like bacterial meningitis can be suspected early. So, for example, if an infant presents with fever and a seizure, it is absolutely wrong to pass it off as a simple febrile seizure. If, especially if the infant's age is less than six months old. It is mandatory that we suspect and rule out or confirm an acute bacterial meningitis. Of course, on direct questioning, we may get additional clues like irritability and refusal to feed. In older children, headache often accompanies fever. But again, if you were to get into the details and realize that this headache did not start on day one of fever but it started on day two or day three of fever and it is not just at the peak of fever but it is also there when the fever is relatively down then it suggests that this might be due to raised ICP especially if it is associated with vomiting. When we want to look for early localization we perform a thorough clinical examination and at such times we may get very subtle clues. So for example, if a child has tachycardia which is disproportionate to the degree of fever, it suggests an underlying toxemia which again points to a bacterial infection. If we get disproportionate tachypnea, it might be an early sign of an upcoming pneumonia. When we get both tachycardia and tachypnea which are disproportionate to the degree of fever, it suggests a systemic inflammatory response which could be an early sign of sepsis. Children with high fever usually have peripheral vasoconstriction. But if we see a highly febrile child with peripheral 
bounding pulses it might be suggesting the warm phase of septic shock we must always do a complete examination and therefore in a febrile irritable infant if we find a bulging anterior fontanelle it suggests acute bacterial meningitis and if we find a bulging inflamed red tympanic membrane it suggests acute otitis media we should also look for local signs of inflammation so besides the examples of tonsillitis and lymphadenitis that we just spoke about we might find a abscess that is a swelling in the subcutaneous tissue which is inflamed red and tender the same thing when spread over a larger area may suggest cellulitis and it is very important to remember that if we don't have a obvious reason for a cellulitis it might indicate an underlying osteomyelitis at times bacterial infections may present without fever so newborns or children who are significantly malnourished or children who are suffering from a immunosuppressive condition or are on immunosuppressive therapy which is commonly steroids in routine office practice such children may not manifest fever during acute bacterial infections even then we can suspect a bacterial infection early when they manifest with symptoms and signs such as poor feeding lethargy hypothermia etc in newborns this is particularly so if they have a history of premature rupture of membranes any child who is on steroids is expected to have a voracious appetite so when such a child comes with loss of appetite it may be a clue to a bacterial infection as sometimes happens in cases of nephrotic syndrome a very important part of suspecting a bacterial infection early is to be on the lookout for such an infection in a situation where the host is particularly predisposed or at increased risk so besides the situation in nephrotic syndrome that we just talked about if a child with nephrotic syndrome complains of significant persistent abdominal pain it may be a situation where we are suspecting bacterial peritonitis which we can diagnose early once we suspect it with other examination and uh, respective investigations in a child who has any obstruction to the flow of secretions of body fluids they are predisposed to bacterial infections so a child with obstructive uropathy or a child with adenoid hypertrophy we will suspect bacterial infection early when they present with fever at times some bacterial infections present with symptoms or signs which seem to be non specific and which could have multiple differentials to explain them for example hepatosplenomegaly in brucellosis or myalgia and red eyes in leptospirosis or a vasculitic lesion in uh, rickettsia shell infections etc so when the epidemiology suggests we pick, tend to pick up these infections in time but at other times it is a high index of suspicion and may be repeated physical examination which will help us to pick up these infections sufficiently early the importance of such infections is that we may need to use antibiotics which are not routinely used to treat these infections early diagnosis of in bacterial infection also depends on how early the patient is brought to us for this parent education is important and we must always educate our parents to bring the children when there is a change in sensorium or fast breathing or reduced urine output. Finally friends we often use investigations to diagnose bacterial infections but we must remember that investigations like uh, investigation findings like neutrophilic leukocytosis and elevated CRP are very non specific markers of inflammation and they may not necessarily mean a acute bacterial infection so we must not rely only on such investigations to pick these infections early we must have a strong clinical correlation so to sum up friends we do try to i diagnose bacterial infections early and we can definitely do so if we are aware of 
subtle markers in history and clinical examination and we are on the lookout for such pointers. Thank you. The next video will be by Dr. Mahesh Moite on early diagnosis of non-infective cough.